Let me just read for you again our text. And I'd like to, I'm just going to back up one verse. I don't know if that's going to create difficulties. But if it's not on the screen, just listen. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. After Paul describes all the efforts he was putting in as a Pharisee to earn a righteousness by which God would accept him, he comes to this conclusion, having, uh, by God's grace, seen Christ and what he has done and what his works were in comparison to his. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his, his word to our uh, hearing this morning. Now, I told you I was going to review briefly what we've been looking at so far in this uh, Reformation series, so let me do that. Now, remember, we've been looking at the five solas of the Reformation. Sola is a Latin word that essentially means alone. And what the Reformers were essentially... Um, trying to tell us through these solas is what the Bible teaches uh, regarding how we are saved is over against what Rome actually taught and believed. Now, so far, we've seen that the Reformers believed that there is only one authority in the church that we should listen to, one that we should pay attention to when it comes to what we are to believe regarding God and how it is He wants us to live. And that authority is not what people think. It's not what the church necessarily thinks. It's not the opinions of the popes and the councils. It's, it's not even for us as Protestants the opinions of our friends or family members, but rather it is what God says in his word. Now that is what sola scriptura means. The Bible alone is the authority. Uh, with regard to salvation, that most important thing the Bible teaches us about, how we are saved from God's wrath, how we are just in His sight, God tells us in His Word that that is a gift. It's not something that we have to work for. Uh, we don't, as Rome believes, have to become personally righteous by working with or cooperating with the grace or the help that God gives to us through the sacraments, as they're consecrated by the priests, before God will look at us and say, you are righteous uh, and good enough to enter into heaven. This is something that he works through his son, which is what we're going to look at this morning, and freely gives to us through his son. And we've seen thoroughly that for this salvation to be a gift, for it to be purely of God's grace, that we have to receive it in a way that itself is not a work. We have to receive it by faith alone. Now remember, faith we saw was not something that we do. It's not coming forward at an altar call. It's not praying a prayer uh, with God looking at us and saying, oh, I see that faith. That, that act of faith I will count as your righteousness and I will justify you on the basis of that righteousness. That's what gets you into heaven. That's not the way faith works. That turns faith into a work. But rather, faith is something that looks completely away from what we do, from self, and looks to what Jesus has done alone in order to save us. A faith that we saw last week is itself a gift of God's grace. Faith is not something we can do as we come into the world, but it's something that God gives to us through the miracle of the new birth. As Jesus told Nicodemus when he asked, how can a man be born again when he's old? And he says, it's only through the Spirit of God. Spirit breathes where he wills. You hear the sound of it. You don't know where it comes from, where it's going. That is the wind. But you see its effects upon the lives of men where the Spirit of God breathes life into us. 
It changes us. It makes us to be like Jesus. Now, today we're going to look at the fourth sola, the what's called solus Christus, which means Christ alone. Remember, Christ is uh, basically the, um, the title that is given to Jesus. Christ means anointed one. It's the Greek equivalent of the word Messiah. Uh, it's the one that God has anointed and sent into the world to be the, the redeemer and the mediator. So oftentimes Jesus, which is his name, is referred to as Jesus the Christ because that's who he is. Christ is not his name. Christ is his title. Jesus is his name. But Jesus, solus Christus, means that Jesus Christ is the only mediator that God has provided for man to be reconciled to God. He is the only one that has done everything that is needed to justify us, to make us acceptable to God, and to keep us justified that he might bring us to heaven. And again, the reformers um, basically uh, asserted this as over against the Roman Catholic view of, uh, of their mediation. You know, the Roman church essentially when we see here's God and here's man and God gives us Christ to, to uh, be our mediator between us and God, Rome places the church between us and Jesus and says that we need their mediation, we need their mediators, we need their priests, we need their sacraments, we need their saints and the intercession of the saints. We need the Pope and his office as the vicar of Christ in order to come to God, in order to come to Christ that we might come to God. But the Bible says, which is our authority, all we need is Jesus. Now, what I want us to do, first of all, this morning is consider what a mediator is because perhaps we don't fully understand how a mediator works in a situation like this. But a mediator is somebody, I think you know, who stands between two parties that are at odds with one another in order to reconcile them with each other. And particularly when these two parties have entered into an agreement or a covenant now, we have examples in, in our society. I mean, mediators are used when uh, two business, perhaps uh, companies that have some kind of agreement, uh, have a conflict between them. They use mediators to try to come and resolve those conflicts and to try to reconcile them and get them to keep the terms of the contract. Uh, mediators are used in, uh, in the case of marriage counseling. Uh, two people, uh, a husband and wife, enter into uh, a marriage covenant and perhaps they're having a difficult time keeping the terms of their covenant, which is to love one another and, and to do as the, as the Bible calls us to do. The marriage counselor steps in and he mediates and he tries to bring them both back together. Well, the fact is the Bible tells us that we, when we came into this world, were at odds with God. You see, we were in covenant with God when we came into the world, the covenant that God had made with Adam and with the whole human race in Adam. And we broke that covenant when Adam broke that covenant. And so we are alienated from God. We are at odds with God because we have broken the covenant. And the only way that we could ever be reconciled to him is through a mediator. Somebody had to step in and to mediate between the two of us to bring us back together. Now, this is what God, in His great love and mercy, has provided for us. Now, this is actually something we see throughout the entirety of the Bible, and I think it's important because, uh, in a certain sense, uh, this work of mediation is something we need to be involved in as well, and we're going to see that in just a moment. But in the Old Testament, God gave various mediators, you know, First of all, he gave the patriarchs. Those would be the, uh, those, remember, like, uh, well, like from the very beginning, Adam, and then his children who were the heads of their households all the way through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all the way to the time of Moses and um, the uh, priesthood that was established at the time of Moses. But the patriarchs would stand between their families and God and mediate between them. Moses and the priests uh, would stand between God and man and mediate in order to reconcile them. And of course, we know finally the Lord gave his son. 
in order to stand between us and God and to reconcile us together in the new covenant. And that's what all these mediators were actually pointing to, the mediation of our Lord Jesus. Now, secondly, in order to do this work, in order to stand between us and God to bring us together, there was something that these mediators needed to do, basically two things. They had to offer a sacrifice and they had to pray. Now, that's what the patriarchs essentially did. Um, we believe this is something Adam did from the very beginning. Adam was the mediator. He was the priest of his own household. And I think we can deduce that he was from what we see his children doing. We read in Genesis 4, verses 3 and 5, and perhaps this will shed some light on this passage if, if you don't quite understand what it says. It says this, So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. Maybe you wonder, why isn't it that God accepted Cain's sacrifice? Well, let, let's take a look at this. Now, when he says in the course of time, he's literally saying in, in the Hebrew language, at the end of days, at the end of a, this, this seven-week cycle, there was a six-day six work week, and the seventh day, the day that God rested, the day that he blessed for our good, the Sabbath, was the day that his people would meet together to worship him. And that's what we see Cain and Abel doing. At, in the course of time, or at the end of days, they brought their sacrifice. Now, on this day, Cain brought something <clears throat> that he had grown from the ground. You know, fruits, vegetables, probably some kind of a grain offering. But Abel brought something from the flock in order to offer it to God. Now, God accepted Abel's offering, but he didn't accept Cain's. And the reason why he didn't was because Cain's was not an animal sacrifice. It wasn't the kind of sacrifice that God had shown uh, them, the kind that he wanted them to give him when he first applied the covenant of grace to Adam and Eve after the fall. You'll recall that when Adam and Eve, uh, after the fall and after God had basically pronounced the curse upon the serpent and upon the man, upon the woman and so forth, God killed some of his animals. He made a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, and he covered their nakedness with the skins. Essentially, God wanted a blood sacrifice. That was the example he gave to them. And the blood sacrifice was to point forward to the sacrifice of the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the seed of the woman who eventually would give his life for the sins of the world, for everyone who would trust in him. Now, the point is Cain and Abel both knew that that's what God wanted, which shows us that Adam had been sacrificing and he had been mediating on behalf of his household as God had shown him to do. They had learned by his example. As we continue through the Bible, we see that Noah did exactly the same thing. He was a mediator between his household and God, and it's because of that mediation that his household alone was saved through the flood. Remember when he was gathering animals for the ark, that he brought in seven pairs of the clean animals because those are the ones he would sacrifice. You can't, you know, if you, if you have all the animals that are left in the world on your ark, you don't want to, you know, cause any of them to become extinct. So he had to bring on extra ones that he could use for sacrificing. But of those that were unclean, he only brought one pair of each in order that they might repopulate the earth. The first thing that Noah did when the flood was over and he got off the ark was he built an altar and he sacrificed Again, mediating between his family, which was the only family left in the world, and God. And Job, who lived during the time of Abraham, he was the patriarch. He was the head of his household. And he also acted as a mediator and as a priest of his household. We read in Job 1, verses 4 and 5, uh, these words. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day. And they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. 
So Job, on behalf, on behalf of his household, was continually sacrificing, praying, and mediating between his family and God. So sacrifices were offered, prayers were made to God for God's mercy and for his blessing upon their households. Now this continued until the time of Moses when the Lord established the priesthood to mediate between him and his people through their continual sacrifices and their intercession. During that time, the heads of the household continued to mediate for their households. They would sacrifice and they would pray but now, when they brought their sacrifices, they would bring them to the temple so that the priests might offer them to the Lord. I only bring this up to point out this, that heads of household are to be mediators in their households. Okay? Now, we don't take you know, animals and sacrifice them to the Lord. We don't take our pets and offer blood sacrifices because the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave once and for all, the blood which forever is able to sanctify all who will trust in him. We don't sacrifice, but as heads of household, we do point our children to that sacrifice, the only sacrifice that can reconcile them to God, and we are continually to pray for them. But now let me just point this out. All of these mediators and their sacrifices, and their prayers, were all pointing to one thing. They were pointing to Jesus, who as our great high priest would reconcile us to God through the sacrifice of himself. It's only because of his work that, that any of these were actually saved or benefited at all from the sacrifices or the prayers of the patriarchs or the priesthood. It was only because of what Jesus would do when he did that work. So finally, let's consider what Jesus did and what he continues to do as our mediator. Now remember, we noted at the beginning, Rome, the Roman Catholic Church, believes that, that they stand between Jesus and us with their popes and their priests, with their saints and their sacraments in order to reconcile us to God. Well, Paul tells us we don't need any of those things. All we need is Jesus, and that's what he tells us in our passage. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to make reference to various parts of the passage that we've been looking at. I want you to notice, first of all, uh, what Paul says in verse 11, what, what his goal was, what it was he was after in his own life, what, what was he seeking after, what was the ultimate purpose. He says this in verse 11, that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, Paul did not mean here that only some people are going to be resurrected and others aren't, and only those who follow Jesus are actually going to come out of the graves, because in the general resurrection, everyone is going to be a part of that, whether we believed in Jesus or not. Everyone who has ever lived is going to be raised and judged on that day. But what Paul is talking about here is to attain to the resurrection of life. He wanted to be among those who stood among the sheep, the righteous, on the day of judgment. In other words, Paul wanted to be safe. He wanted to be saved. His goal was that he would not end up in hell, but he would end up in heaven. Now, secondly, I want you to notice how he pursued this goal. It wasn't through his works. He says in verse 7, but whatever things were gained to me, again, all the things he did as a Pharisee, these things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. He thought these works of his made him acceptable to God, but now he saw those works for what they really were. Worthless, refuse. And by the way, the word refuse doesn't just mean garbage. It essentially means uh, dung, okay? In the eyes of the Lord, his good works appeared to the Lord as a big pile of manure. That, that's all it was. And he realized that once he saw Jesus in the way that he needed to see him through the new eyes the Spirit of God gives him. He says in verse 8, More than that, I count all things to be lost, not just the things I thought were gain, but the things that I have now, everything in this world. I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, 
dung, manure, so that I may gain Christ. Now, I want you to notice what Paul thinks about our works in the eyes of God. What does God think about the things we do? Now, God sees them as obnoxious, okay? And that's why Rome can't be right when they say that our justification is somehow based upon our works. Our salvation can't be based upon our works because the only thing we can add to what Jesus Christ has done is a pile of manure. And that does not enhance what Jesus has done. That takes away from it. And that's true whether before we come to Jesus or after we come to Jesus. Our works are still would be like that in God's eyes except for Jesus. Now, we do have to admit that when we do come to Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have a real love in our hearts for Him. But we still have a lot of sin. And that sin makes what we do unacceptable to God, which is why we need to offer them to Him through Jesus. Jesus takes what we do and makes it acceptable to Him. So it can't be by our works. So then how did Paul pursue uh, attaining to this resurrection? And how can we pursue it? How should we pursue it? Well, again, the answer was incorporated in sola gratia and sola fide, only by the grace of God, only through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It comes only through the righteousness that God provides through His Son. Paul tells us we must be in Christ. Now, in Christ, in Him, these are terms we see throughout the Bible, but we need to come to grips with what that word actually means. It means to be united to Jesus by faith. We have to be united to Him if we are to be saved. Now, listen again to what Paul writes in verses 8 through 9. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, that is through my works, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now, what Paul is telling us here is this, that Jesus as our mediator, as our great high priest, is the author, is the source of the righteousness we need in order to be acceptable to God. He is the only one in whom we can be reconciled to God. And the reason is because he is the only one of everyone who has ever lived he is the only one who has obeyed the law of God perfectly. He is the only one who has offered a sacrifice of himself on the cross for our crimes. His suffering and death satisfies the justice of God, and he's the only one whose prayers are actually effective for us. As our mediator, Jesus sacrificed himself through his obedience, through his death on the cross, and he prays. He is, he is the only mediator that the Father will accept. But for his work to do us any good, we have to be in him. Think of Jesus. Like in the days of Noah, as the ark of our salvation. I think the ark was actually a picture of Jesus. Only those who were in the ark, when the wrath of God came, were saved. Everybody else was destroyed. We have to be in the ark. We have to be in Christ in order to be saved. And what that means is we must be in union with him. Now, let's think about this union for just a moment. There, there are several ways in which the Bible says the believer is united with Jesus. But two, I think, are the most important are essentially these, what we call a vital union or a living union and what we call a legal union with Jesus. Now, when we came into this world, when we were born into this world, we were in union with someone. We were in union with Adam. The Bible says we were in Adam when we were born, united to him, united to one who was dead, a spiritually dead person. And so we were spiritually dead, okay? When Adam sinned in the garden, he died spiritually. And when he did that, 
we also died in him. His one act of, in his representing us brought about the death of the whole human race. But when Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to unite us with him, when the Spirit of God plugged us into the life of Jesus, the Bible says he raised us to life. Now, by the way, that's only true of those who are trusting in Jesus. The only reason why you're trusting in Jesus is because he sent his Spirit to unite you to Jesus in this vital or living union and to make you alive. We read in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, after Paul describes our condition as we come into the world, basically the children of wrath, following the God of this world, doing what the rest of the people of this world were doing, and being the children of wrath, which means that one day we would have been punished for those sins forever in hell. Paul writes this in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. Okay, so we came into this world in Adam dead, and God in his mercy made us alive together with Christ. He united us to Christ and made us alive. So that's the first union, this living and vital union that the Spirit of God creates between us and Christ so that his life flows through us and we become alive. But we had another problem. In Adam, we were also guilty. We had broken God's covenant. We were guilty not only of Adam's sin. That sin was credited to us because he represented us. But we were also guilty of all the other sins that we had committed. And we were under the just sentence of death, which would have ended in eternal death and punishment. But when the Spirit of God raised us to life and he made us alive and gave us the power to believe and we believed in the Lord Jesus and we trusted Jesus, the Bible says we came into a legal union with Jesus. We were in him and in him our sins were taken away and his righteousness was given to us. And now that we are in Christ, now that we are in union with our mediator, Everything that he has earned, everything he deserves for his obedience, for his perfect work, the love and the acceptance of his Father, the kingdom of heaven, uh, its present state and in the future state, the new heavens and the new earth, everything he deserves, we also now deserve in him. That's what it means when it says we are joint heirs of his kingdom in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can see the importance of union with Christ. We need his life in us in order to believe. And believing, we need this legal union with Jesus to make us acceptable to the Father because in and of ourselves, we are not acceptable. If we stand before God outside of Christ, we will be cast away forever. But if we stand before him in Christ, he will welcome us into his kingdom. Now, the last question that Paul addresses here is this. How can we know that we are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, he tells us essentially that we can know him, that we know him because of essentially three things. We will experience the power of his resurrection. When the Spirit of God makes us alive, we are raised to life. How do we know that we are raised to life? It's because we're experiencing something different than we experienced before. We now have his power working within us, the power no longer to submit to sin. We're no longer the slaves of sin, but now we're free from it, and we have the power to obey. How do we know that we're in union with Jesus? When we are faced with a choice between what is right and what is wrong, we can choose what is right by the power of God for the right reasons, because we love God and we want to give Him glory. That love the Spirit of God gives us breaks the power of sin, gives us a new motive that will allow us to choose the right thing for the right reason. So we will have the power of his resurrection within us. Second, as we see this working itself out in our lives, we will also experience the fellowship of his sufferings. If we live like the Lord Jesus, you know, be become like him, we're also going to be treated like him. 
Uh, Jesus said, don't be surprised if the world hates you. It hated me before it hated you. If they hated the master of the household, they're going to hate the servants of the household. If they falsely accuse the head of the house, they're going to falsely accuse the members of the house. There's no way to get away from it. If you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be hated. If, you're not, if there's not somebody in this world that hates you <laughs> because you're a follower of Jesus, it may be because the life of Jesus is not in you. You're, you're keeping it a well-hidden secret, or maybe it's just not there at all. So that the, again, the, the second way we know is we suffer persecution. And we also see that our life, Paul tells us, will be conformed to his life, will be conformed to his death, which I, which I think Paul means this, his death to sin. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 6, the death that he died, he died to sin. We will be experiencing that. Being conformed to his death means that, that we've died to sin and that we have also been raised to newness of life to obey the Lord. Now, if we know the Lord, if we love him, if we see this power at work in our lives, if we sense this persecution from the world, if we essentially see the, this conformity to the death of Jesus and his resurrection to life, that's how we can know that we will attain to the resurrection from the dead, that we'll be a part of the resurrection of the righteous on that day. So again, Paul reminds us here that this union that saves us will also transform us. We need to make sure we see this work in our lives because if we don't see it, then we haven't been justified. We are not in union with the Lord Jesus. But if we do see it, it means that what Jesus did, he did for us. It means that we are in him. We are in union with him. It means that he is our mediator. And it also means that Jesus is going to make sure that we get to heaven. He's done everything we need to be acceptable to the Father. And he's going to continue to do everything that is necessary to get us from here to there. And again, the point this, this morning and essentially this evening is this. We don't need anything else. We don't need the Roman church. We don't need her mediation. We don't need her mediators. All we need is the mediation that God provides through Jesus, through his obedience, through his death, and through his prayers to save us and bring us to glory. Let me just back up for a moment. That doesn't mean that we don't need to come and worship the Lord. That's not what is being said. But the Roman church has those that are her members basically in captivity, in bondage. And they're saying, you can't be saved unless you come from us, go through us to Jesus. But we're saying that Roman church doesn't have to be there. We go directly to Jesus, and that's how we're reconciled to God. And that's the only way. We can't be reconciled through Rome. We have to be reconciled through Jesus. Paul writes this in 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. How many mediators are there? Just one. That is really what solus Christus means, Christ alone. He is the only way that we can approach God. And that is what the supper reminds us of this morning. So let's, let's uh, take just a couple of moments, shall we, and let's bow in silent prayer. And let's ask the Lord to help us examine ourselves with regard to our interest in Christ and to know their salvation and no one else. Jesus is the only mediator. We have to come to him. But let's also look for the evidence that we do belong to him, those marks of his grace, the power of his resurrection, the sufferings, uh, the conformity to the death of Jesus, the fellowship that we are to have with the Lord Jesus as we prepare to come to the table. And then we'll spend just a couple of moments uh, preparing to come before we celebrate. So let's pray.